This, this is Saurabh, and, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The BG Show with Aditya. Thanks to Pseudo Media, we now live in a world of hashtags. You want to protest about something? Hashtag this. You want to support something? Hashtag that and so on and so forth the hashtag nonsense along with tweeting retweeting or any other such pseudo media discussion continues despite knowing the fact that it is the biggest headache that humanity has ever had to face over the past 15 years but pseudo media is not the only headache that has become part of humanity over the past 200 days another headache has become a part of humanity there's pseudo media and now there's the pseudo virus this world of hashtag amuses me a parallel pseudo campaign on such pseudo media sites is what humanity loves but the irony is that on one hand, everyone is aware that information on pseudo media isn't exactly the one to be digested. Yet, once present on such pseudo media platforms, is almost the requirement of the 21st century. The debate has been about pseudo media's harmful effects on society but the question is why do we allow it to become harmful? The question is not whether the pseudo media has an harmful effect on society. Well even having junk food or food with huge amounts of Calories can also have an harmful effect on the psyche as well as the body of an individual. So why don't we do the same experiment we do with fast food and junk food? For example, I consume junk food every 3 to 4 weeks so that I enjoy it yet I do not get addicted to it. Same way, pseudo media should be taken as a platform for entertainment it is 98 percent entertainment and two percent information the debate about being trolled on such pseudo media site never ends well how do you tackle such situations it is a simple thing if somebody trolls or says something harmful to you on such sites ignore them these trolls and fanatics only target a certain individual because they know that this individual has a tendency to react to feel bad if they target an individual especially a celebrity and that individual doesn't respond ignores them these same trolls will disappear like water vapor they stick because we react. They will send a message on such sites that I was trolled today. Isn't that a spot of publicity? If you are trolled, do you have to tell the whole world? Do you want to publicize the fact that you were trolled or pseudo abused on such platforms? Why don't you just ignore them and let it be? Why do you want to tell the whole world? For example, a few weeks ago, if you read in newspapers, a former retired sports person said something about the quality of a team in the Indian 20 over domestic competition. He said that this team is not good enough to make it to the semi finals and the finals of the competition. And what happens? 20 other people react. Opinions are like noses. Everybody has them. But what was the real motivation behind this sports athlete or retired sports person talking about the team? Because this sports person wanted attention. 
whether he meant in real that the team was doing good or bad that was not even the single focal point of his he wanted some kind of publicity and then a few pseudo experts jumped in the band wagon and trolled him in return well even if he got trolled any publicity is good publicity he got his name in the mainstream and the pseudo media had this been an ordinary individual who was not popular even before this situation nobody would have noticed it so this is what individuals look for they look for celebrities who are not in the limelight they want that this celebrity says something foolish or says something for publicity and then the pseudo experts who were basically nobodies they jump in the bandwagon and their name comes in the print and the pseudo media so eventually it's a win win situation for everyone involved even if it is said that it is a bit of a negative situation i tend not to take any such campaigns or hashtag campaigns created on such pseudo media sites seriously because it doesn't have that credibility to be taken seriously because hashtags can be created for anything you don't have to use much of an effort to say anything on such pseudo sites there is this almost new found expectation that every time an incident happens whether it's negative positive or somewhere in the middle we expect such pseudo celebrities to say something if they don't then they are silent then they don't support or vilify the particular incident if they say something against the incident then they would be trolled by the very group who has started the incident if they are for the incident then they will be trolled by the group who is protesting against the incident and the most hilarious part is that the actions of such pseudo celebrities is taken as a gold standard of what should be done just like any other media whether it's print electronic pseudo media is a choice one doesn't need to have a pseudo media account or read things on pseudo media sites just because it's a requirement of the 21st century because if individuals still get hurt by what is being said on such pseudo media or any such sites and despite the claims of being surrounded by technology it is a universal truth that human beings are still primitive in nature because they have this tendency to argue about the pettiest of things and there is a big difference between arguing about pettiest of things and being sensitive sometimes not responding to a situation is also being sensitive there is no need to butt in like in real life if we ignore the bullies if we ignore the bullies or the trolls on such pseudo media sites they will disappear if we react respond tell the whole world that i was said such things they will jump they will be popular then the question becomes is even this trolling part a part of the publicity or is it so well disguised that even the trolls become part of the publicity and we feel sympathy and empathy for the pseudo celebrity being trolled pseudo media as an abstract medium is neither good nor bad it's the human beings in their primitive thought process who make it good or bad it's all up to us if we ignore it will go away if we add fuel to the fire then it will become good or bad and it's a universal truth that all these hashtag campaigns are created by people who have nothing 
to do they are vagabond but them empty vessels make the most noise makes sense because their cpu is empty the labors of hercules chapter 1 i am a plain man monsieur pirot said sir joseph higgin hercules Poirot made a non-committal gesture with his right hand. It expressed, if you choose to take it so, admiration for the solid worth of Sir Joseph's career and an appreciation of his modesty in so describing himself. It could have also conveyed a graceful deprecation of the statement. in any case it gave no clue to the thought then uppermost in hercule pirot's mind which was that sir joseph certainly was using the term in its more colloquial sense a very plain man indeed hercule pirot's eyes rested critically on the swelling jowl the small pig eyes the bulbous nose and the closed lipped mouth the whole general effect reminded him of someone or something but for the moment he could not recollect who or what it was a memory stirred dimly a long time ago in belgium something surely to do with soap sir joseph was continuing no friends about me i don't beat about the bush most people mr poirot would let this business go write it off as a bad debt and forget about it but that's not joseph higgins way i am a rich man and in a manner of speaking 200 pounds is neither here nor there to me poirot interpolated swiftly i congratulate you huh sir joseph paused a minute his small eyes narrowed themselves still more he said sharply that's not to say that i am in the habit of throwing my money about what i want i pay for but i pay the market price no more hercule poirot said you realize that my fees are high yes yes but this sir joseph looked at him cunningly is a very small matter hercule poirot shrugged his shoulders he said i do not bargain i am an expert for the services of an expert you have to pay sir joseph said frankly I know you are a tip top man at this sort of thing. I made inquiries and I was told that you were the best man available. I mean to get to the bottom of this business and I don't grudge the expense. That's why I got you to come here. Homer's Iliad book 2: The Great Gathering of armies now the great array of gods and chariot driving men slept all night long but the peaceful grip of sleep could not hold zeus turning it over in his mind how to exalt achilles how to slaughter hordes of achaeans pin against their ships as his spirit churned at least one plan seemed best he would send a murderous dream to agamemnon calling out to the vision zeus winged it on go murderous dream to the fast achaean ships and once you reach agamemnon's shelter rouse him order him word for word exactly as i command tell it wees to arm his long haired achaeans to attack at once full force now he can take the broad streets of troy the immortal gods who hold olympus clash 
no more. Thus, appeals have brought them round, and all agree, graves are about to crush the men of Troy. At that command, the dream went binging off and passing quickly along the fast trim ships made for the king and found him soon some asleep in his tent with refreshing god sent slumber drifted round him hovering at his head the vision rose like nestor ulysses son the chief agamemnon honored most inspired with nestor's voice and sent by zeus the dream cried out still asleep agamemnon the son of atreus that skilled breaker of horses how can you sleep all night a man weighed down with duties your armies turning over their lives to your command responsibilities so heavy listen to me quickly i bring you a message sent by zeus a world away but he has you in his heart he pities you now so he commands you to arm your long haired achaeans to attack at once full force now you can take the broad streets of troy the immortal gods who hold olympus clash no more hera's appeals have brought them round and all agree greece from zeus are about to crush the men of troy but keep this message firmly in your mind remember let no loss of memory overcome you when the sweet grip of slumber sets you free with that the dream departed leaving him there his heart racing with hopes that would not come to pass he thought he would take the city of priam then that very day the fool how could he know what work the father had in mind the father still bent on plaguing the argives and trojans both with wounds and groans in the bloody press of battle but rousing himself from sleep the divine voice swirling around him it was sat up bold awake pulled on a soft tunic linen never burned and threw it over his flaring battle cape under his smooth feet he fastened supple sandals across his shoulder slung his silver studded sword and he seized the royal scepter of his fathers its power can never die and grasping it tightly off his sword to the ships of argives armed in bronze now the goddess dawn climbed up to olympus heights declaring the light of day to zeus and the deathless gods as the king commanded heralds to cry out loud and clear and muster the long haired achaeans to full assembly their cries rang out battalions gathered quickly pg woodhouse stiff upper lip jeeves how long i remained motionless like a ventilocus dummy whose ventilocus has gone off to the local and left it sitting i cannot say probably not so very long for when life returned to the rigid limbs and i legged it for the open spaces to try and find gussy and warn him of this v shaped depression which was coming his way spood was still in sight he was disappearing in a nor nor easterly direction so not wanting to hobnob with him again while he was in this what you might call difficult mood i pushed off south south west and found that i couldn't have set my course more shortly there was a sort of u alley or dendron walk or some such thing 
confronting me and as I entered it I saw Gussie. He was standing in a kind of trance and his fat headedness in standing when he ought to have been running like a rabbit smote me like a blow and lent an extra emphasis to the hoy with which I accosted him. And as I approached him, I noted that he seemed even more braced than when last seen. The eyes behind the horn-rimmed spectacles gleamed with a brighter light and a smile wreathed his lips. He looked like a fish that's just learned that its witch uncle in Australia has pecked out and left a packet. Ah, Bertie, he said, we decided to go for a walk, not a row. He thought it might be a little chilly on the water. What a beautiful evening, Bertie, is it not? I couldn't see eye to eye with him there. It strikes you as that. Doesn't it? It doesn't me. He seemed surprised. In what respect do you not find it up to sample? Tell you in what respect I do not find it up to sample. That's all this I hear about you and Emerald Stoker. Did you kiss her? The soul's awakening expression on his face became intensified. Before my revolted eyes, Augustus Fink Nautil definitely smoked. Bertie, I did, and I'll do it again if it's the last thing I do. What a girl, Bertie. So kind, so sympathetic. She's my idea of a thoroughly womanly woman, and you don't see many of them around these days. I hadn't time when I was in your room to tell you about what happened at the school treat. He told me, he said, Bartholomew hit you and how right he was. The bounder bit me to the bone. And do you know what Emerald Stoker did? Not only did she coo over me like a mother comforting a favorite child, but she bathed and bandaged my lacerated leg. She was a ministering angel, the nearest thing to Florence Nightingale you could hope to find. It was shortly after she had done the swabbing and bandaging that I kissed her. You shouldn't have kissed her. Again, he showed surprise. He had thought he said a pretty sound idea. But you are engaged to Madeline. I had hoped with these words to start his conscience working on all 12 cylinders, but something seemed to have gone wrong with the machinery, for he remained as calm and unmoved as the fish on ice he so closely resembled. Ah, Madeline, he said, I was about to touch on Madeline. Shall I tell you what's wrong with Madeline Basse? No heart. That's where she slips up. Lovely to look at, but nothing here, he said, tapping the left side of his chest. Do you know how she reacted to that serious flesh wound of mine? She espoused Bartholomew's cause. She said the whole thing was my fault. She accused me of having teased the little blister. In short, she behaved like a louse. How different from Emerald Stoker. Do you know what Emerald Stoker did? You told me. I mean, in addition to binding up my wounds, she went straight off to the kitchen and cut me a package of sandwiches. I have them here, said Gussie, exhibiting a large parcel and eyeing it reverently. Ham, he added in a voice that throbbed with emotion. She made them for me with her own hands. And I thought it was her thoughtfulness, even more than her divine sympathy, that showed me that she was the only girl in the world for me. The scales fell from my eyes and I saw that what I had once felt for Madeline had been just a 
boyish infatuation. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.